we know that we can construct interpretations. And these interpretations essentially tell us the meaning of all these things, like the universe of discourse, the predicates, the constants, etc. Now, we also know that interpretations can make statements true or false. What we're going to focus on in this video is a particular type of interpretation, which is an extensional finite abstract model. Remember, a model is just an interpretation that is intended to show or demonstrate some sort of semantic property. So we're going to develop these extensional finite abstract models, and the key skill that we really need to adopt here is how to do abstract translations. Fortunately, abstract translations is something that we've practiced in previous units when we had to translate symbolic sentences back into English. So when you take a look at a sentence like for all x, fx, arrow gx, what does this actually mean? Well, we know the meaning of this depends on the universe of discourse, and it also depends on how we define the F predicate and the G predicate. But even if we don't have a full uh, definition of the universe of discourse and F and G, we can still actually abstractly translate the meaning behind for all X, FX, arrow GX. And of course, it really just means all Fs are Gs. Now, what does all mean? Well, it means all things in the universe of discourse. What does F and G mean? Well, it just means F and G. And it's true we can provide a detailed interpretation or model that will define it, but that's not stopping us from initially having a nice abstract translation for us to work with. Now, abstract translation is a really important skill, so we're going to practice some examples of abstract translation here. For all x, bx, biconditional dx. What does this mean? The trick to abstract translation is that you want to get away from using the variable letters. You don't want to use x, even though it says for all x. And we want to talk about the relationships between b as well as d, and we also want to talk about what things belong to b and what things belong to d, for example. So when you look at this, we know the logical relationship behind this, and really what this just means is that b and d are identical. So we don't have to translate this in a way that involves quantification or variables, we just want to translate in a way that we can make sense of it and understand. And of course this means B and D are the same, they're identical. Here's another example. There exists something for all X and DX. Uh, this is nice and straightforward. This means that something is both an A and D. And notice there's a single existential here, so that means that something is both an A and a D. Compare that to the next example where I have there exists an X, AX, and there exists an X, DX. Now here, I'm not necessitating that what is the A and what is the D are different. Um, in fact, they could be the same. My abstract translation has to be open to that. So a nice way of sort of expressing that is just to say A and D are non-empty. They don't have sort of no members to them. And this way, I don't really know if it's the same, if it's different, it doesn't matter. Of course, you don't have to say it like that. You could just abstractly translate it to say something is an A and something is a D, and that's equivalent to saying A and D are non-empty. There exists an X, AX, and not FX. Again, we just assert the positive relationship we know about A, but we also notice that this single existential quantifier is telling us something about its relationship to F, namely, it's not F. So just casually put, we say something is an A and not in F, or not an F, if you prefer. For all x, gx, conditional negation mx, well, the way to phrase a conditional isn't to say everything, it's really to say if something is a g, or more casually, you can just say all g's have the following property. And this works in the way that we've learned to symbolize, where we know we start with the group and then we end with the property. So here the group is g and the property is not m. So the abstract translation here is all g's are not m, because that's the property of the group G. Negation for all x, bx biconditional dx. Well, if you think about how the negation should work, it should mean the opposite of what it means without it. So we know that for all x, bx biconditional dx means b and d are the same. So if you have the negation in front, it just means b and d are different. Uh, and what you can sort of start seeing is that we can actually have sort of odd forms of logical symbols that don't necessarily follow our canonical form when we're symbolizing, but we know enough about the meanings to still generate nice abstract translations of them. So here's an example. For all x, ax, or lx. Now this isn't something we would naturally symbolize, but it really just means something straightforward. 
everything in my universe of discourse is A or it's L. And notice or we use in the regular inclusive sense because that's how or always is in logic. Now again, we can have weirder examples. So this is for all x negation bx biconditional gx. And you can just imagine that I'm going to do a negation of biconditional on that uh, inside there. And then what I really get is that everything, if you're in B, then you're not in G. And if you're not in G, then you're in B. And so what this really amounts to, and you might have recognized this, is the form of exclusive or. So this says everything in my universe of discourse is B or exclusively in G. So they can't be both, one or the other, but not both. I have for all x negation dx arrow nx. And again, this is just a nice conditional. So the group is the not d and the property is n. So this translates to if you're not a d, then you're an n. And finally, I have there exists an fx and gx in the antecedent. And then the consequent is negation ey dy. This isn't so complicated. It's just that you need to read it part by part and preserve the relationships of the connectives. So here the main connective isn't a quantifier, the main, main operator isn't a quantifier, it's actually just the conditional. So I'm going to say that this translates to if something is an F and a G, then nothing is a D, because it's not the case there exists a, something that is in the D predicate. Now what I did in one of the previous example was something I call an informal equivalence. So often we'll try and abstractly translate something when we want to generate a model, but it's sort of awkward to translate. Like I don't really know what this means because my sort of standard way of understanding existentials is that it should be paired with a conjunction, not with a conditional. So how do I make sense of a sentence like this, which says it's not the case of an existential, but the main connective on the inside is a conditional. And that sort of seems problematic. Well, what we can do is we can do an informal equivalence, which is really like a mini derivation where I'm allowing myself to be sort of free from the restrictions of the derivation system. And I'm just writing out things that I know are logically equivalent. So I clearly know that I could do a quantifier negation to this. Now, in my derivation system, I'm not really allowed to do a negation of conditional when I still have that universal on. But surely I know that's logically equivalent, so I'm going to informally do that here. And then I have this as a result, where I have the antecedent and the negation of the consequent. But of course, I also know that not not gx is really just gx. And even though I'm not really allowed to do that in my derivation system, unless I have more sophisticated rules at my fingertips, I surely I know this is logically equivalent. And because I'm not doing a derivation, I can still do this informal equivalence. Now, why does this matter? Because this last sentence translates quite nicely. I've actually removed the negation. And even though I have a universal paired with a conjunction, it's still easier to translate. And this means that everything is an F and a G. We're now going to use these skills of abstract translation to build a finite abstract model. And this model will be extensional, which means that we're going to take use of set theory, uh, which we learned in the previous video. So I'm going to demonstrate that the following set is consistent. So here is a set of three statements, and I want to demonstrate their consistency. So the first thing I need to do is abstractly translate these things so I really know what these sentences mean. Remember, we're doing semantics here, and meaning is everything. And even though the meaning depends on the definitions of B and D and the universe of discourse, I can still get really far with this abstract translation. So the first sentence, for all x, bx by conditional dx, we've already taken a look at this, B and D are identical. The second sentence says something is an A and not a D. And the third sentence is pretty straightforward. D is non-empty. That's a fancy way of just saying something is a D. All right, well, where do we start from there? Now we're able to construct our finite abstract model. And what our model will look like is essentially a demonstration of the consistency of these sentences by stipulating the meanings of the universe of discourse, the A predicate, the B predicate, as well as the D predicate. And we're going to stipulate these meanings extensionally, which means we're going to define them in terms of memberships using sets. Now, the way I always like to start construction of these models 
is to begin with the universe of two members. And I'm just going to use 0 and 1 for my two members. You could really use anything you want, A, B, circle, square. Uh, the reason why 0 and 1 are sort of nice is because if you use A and B, that might confuse us with A and B that are syntactically part of our system. So 0 and 1 are better than alphabet choices. Regardless, now that I'm ready to sort of start, I have to pick a good starting point. Which sentence do I want to focus on to make true? Well, I typically like to pick the easiest one on the board, and the easiest sentence is that D is non-empty. Now, what it means for D to be non-empty means something in the universe is a D. Now, which one? Zero or one? It doesn't matter. Because we're constructing this sort of backwards from the meanings, uh, as long as we sort of keep checking over and over again, this is essentially a little game where we get to stipulate certain things, and then we will sort of uh, live with that stipulation later on when we have to do other sort of tasks. So for D being non-empty, I'm just going to go ahead and arbitrarily say, fine, zero, which is one of the things in my universe of discourse, is going to be that D, is going to be in D, and now suddenly I have made the third sentence true. It is true that D is non-empty. Okay, well, what else am I going to do? Let's do the middle one. Something is an A and not a D. Okay, well, what member of my universe am I going to pick to be in the A predicate, and at the same time, it can't be in the D predicate. Well, immediately, I hope you see that we can't pick zero. We can't pick zero to be our A, that's not D, because zero is already in D, because we picked that, uh, I don't know, 30 seconds ago. So instead, I'm going to naturally select something different from my universe of discourse, and I will select the member one. So one is the thing in my UD, that is now an A, but at the same time, it is not a D, because it doesn't appear in the extension of the D predicate. Finally, I have to make sure that B and D are identical. Well, that's pretty straightforward. I take a look at the D predicate, and it has zero as a member, so how do I make B and D identical? I also put zero into the B predicate. When I have finished going through my sentences, you always need to go back and double check. So I want to take a look and ask, is it the case that B and D are identical? Well, yes. Is it the case that something is an A and not a D? Yes. Is it the case that D is non-empty? Yes. I have successfully set all these sentences to be true, and of course I wanted to do that because I wanted to show that these are consistent. Once I'm done, I close the sets of all my predicates to indicate that I'm done, and that's my solution. So my finite abstract model is just what's in that green box there. All the other translations, technically that's not part of your answer, but it's the sort of steps that I like to take to solve the problem. There's lots of sort of tips that we should uh, pay attention to for doing finite abstract models. Uh, obviously, the most important one is that you really need to focus on your translations. Because I depend so heavily on the abstract translation to solve my model, you need to make sure that you spend the time to get that translation correct, which means you have to be quite comfortable with just uh, symbolization and translation in general. As you saw, I really like to begin with the universe of discourse of two members. What happens if you don't need two? It doesn't matter. Uh, if you have more members, it's not going to be a problem. What happens if you need more? Well, we'll actually look at an example where we actually need to use more members of our universe of discourse, and we'll see how easy it is to add in. But I sort of find two a really nice sweet spot to start. Uh, you could also ask, how do I know which sentence I should start with when I'm constructing my model? Well, the easiest sentences are those that stipulate a positive fact, which is to say an existential statement. Statements with existentials in them say there is something that has this property. The problem with universals are typically universals are paired with some sort of conditional statement, which says if there's a G, then these things, the G's have these properties. But we're not even sure if there are G's to begin with, and that's somewhat problematic. Because of that, universal statements often require rechecking, and we'll see that in some more complicated examples. And of course, a really ha helpful tip is that you should always make sort of side notes to yourself. If you realize something, oh, I better not put this thing in my model, just write that down somewhere, and that can help guide you as well. It's not just the translations, but it's also other sort of facts that you sort of discern that can really help make models nice and straightforward.
In my last example, I used a finite abstract model to demonstrate consistency of sentences in a set. It turns out that the most sort of uh, important usage and the most common usage of a finite abstract model is to show that a particular argument is invalid. And so we often call these uh, counter models and so or invalidities in general. So let's take a look at an example here. I want to build a finite abstract model that is enough to show that this argument is invalid. Uh, and how am I going to do that? Well, it's pretty straightforward. I know that I need a model that will essentially show that it's possible for all the premises to be true, but at the same time, the conclusion is false. And as we know, if there's a singular interpretation where all the premises are true and the conclusion is false, that is enough to render an argument invalid. So let's sort of tidy this up. And what we're going to do is we're going to abstractly translate our premises and the negation of the conclusion and then see what we can do in terms of building our model. Now here I added the negation. I'll talk about that in a moment. So let's take a look and translate our premises. Notice that our first premise has a name letter in it, the letter, letter A. But that's not a big deal. The meaning of the first premise is clear. It says that A, whatever A is, is F and M. No problem. Taking a look at our second premise, it says for all x, mx, or hx. So again, this isn't a canonical form of a universal, but the meaning is still clear. It says everything in my universe of discourse is m or it's h. Now, because there's no sort of modifications here, it can be both. Premise three, not the case that for everything fx by conditional hx, well, we, as we recall, uh, by, uh, for all x, fx by conditional hx means f and h are the same, so you throw the negation in front, and it just means f and h are different. Now, the last thing is, I want to make my conclusion false. Uh, but sometimes I find that hard to remember when I list out my translations, that the first three things are supposed to be true and the final thing is supposed to be false. So instead, what I often like to do is abstractly translate the negation of the conclusion. Because if I have, if I want the conclusion to be false, surely that means that I want the negation of the conclusion to be true, and then I don't have to be so confused about what it is that I'm trying to do. So that's why I have negation C there in my list. So what does it mean? Well, negation for all x, fx, arrow, mx, that means it's not the case that everything in f is an m. It's not the case that every f is an m. Now, some of you might not like that. That sounds a little too wordy, far more complicated than my premises. So we can always do some sort of informal equivalence. So let's scratch that off. And instead, we're going to actually derive informally something that's perfectly logically equivalent. So I'll start with a quantifier negation. That's great. And then like before, I move that negation in using negation of conditional. And there you go. This is my final statement, and I want this to be true. So instead, I'm going to use this to generate my abstract translation. And this means something is an F and not M at the same time. Once we have our abstract translations, we're ready to begin. And to begin means we write out our UD, F1, H1, M1, and A0, because A0 is a name letter. And we start with a universe of discourse of two things, and we're ready to go. So from the tips, we know it's best to start with positive assertions of things, like existentials. But it turns out name letters are the easiest way to start because they also just assert that they exist. Don't forget that when you have a name letter in an argument or something that you're trying to construct a model of, you must stipulate what that name letter is. So we're going to do that by focusing on premise one. A is F and M. OK, again, we don't really worry about what the right choice is. I can pick any member of my universe of discourse to satisfy this premise. Zero, one, if I wanted to add two, I could pick two. It's totally fine. So typically, I just keep it simple for myself, and I start at zero. So if A is an F and an M, that means I have to put zero in F, zero in M, but it also means that A is zero. So A is the name that refers to one of the objects in my universe of discourse, and that object is zero. Notice I'm not using sets around the zero where I've defined A. 
That's because A is a name letter and A picks out a member of my universe of discourse and is not a set in itself. It doesn't, it can't be multiple things. So I hope you see that I've made the first premise true. Now, how do I make premise two and premise three true? Well, I don't know. Uh, those are sort of trickier, but there's another existential claim waiting to sort of be made true, and it's an easy one, and that's the negation of the conclusion. So that's where I'm going to look. Always look for those existentials. They're the easiest place to go. So this says something is F and not M. Okay, well, right now, F and M are the same. They both have zero in it, so that means I need to put something in F that is not an M, and I hope it's obvious that we can't pick zero, so we gotta pick something else, and there's only one other option right now, which is one. So I'm gonna take that second member of my universe of discourse and throw it into the F predicate, and now something is F and not M. The existential statements are always nice, start with them, and then we move on to the more complicated ones. Taking a look at premise two, it says everything is M or H. Okay, well, everything here refers to everything in the universe of discourse. So that's zero as well as one. And so now I know that zero as well as one have to be an M or H. Well, there's a really easy way to solve this. Uh, or what I should say is there's an easy way to make it true. Uh, M already has zero in it. So to make premise two true, I could just throw one into it as well. And now premise two is true. But there's a problem here. The negation of the conclusion, which is also set true, originally said something is F and not M. And now what I've done is I've made F and M the same. So here, this is an example of where I should have made a note to myself. What I should have noted the moment I made the negation of the conclusion true is that I should remind myself not to put one into the M predicate. Because in virtue of one being an F and not an M, I am making the negation of conclusion true. So now that I have this note, I understand I shouldn't have done that. And so there is another trivial way to make premise two true. Everything is an M or an H. Easy way to make that true is to throw everything in my UD, zero as well as one, into the H predicate, which I've just done here. That sounds good. But then when I look at my third premise, it says F and H are different. And so even though I did succeed at making premise two true, and I didn't really violate any of my previous premises, I still have a problem in that the third premise is not currently true. So there's a couple options that we can go through here to make it true. But what I'm gonna focus on is premise two and premise three true at the same time. And the easiest option is to actually just remove the zero element from H. Zero didn't need to be in there anyway. Premise two says everything is a M or H, and I've satisfied that. Zero is M, thumbs up. One is H, thumbs up. So there's no problem there. This looks good. All right, so what I would normally do is just run through and check that everything's good, but premise two and premise three are true. I know the negation of C is true, and premise one is true, and nothing I did sort of messed that up. So when I'm done, I close the set brackets, and that's my solution. Now there was another way to proceed. Instead of actually removing zero from the H predicate, some of you might have thought, oh, I can get around this problem by adding a third element to my universe of discourse and putting that into H as well. Now F and H are different. And in fact, that's correct. Both of these are perfectly legitimate answers. And there's gonna be many answers most of the time that will show an argument is invalid, or any other semantic property that we're considering. Here's a reminder of the semantic properties that we have in multiplace predicate logic. So we can use finite extensional models to sort of show that these properties hold or the negations of properties hold. But even though this is sort of the whole sort of range of semantic properties that we know, Typically, people focus on generating counter models, which is to show that an argument is invalid. And so here's just a reminder of the semantic properties in case you uh, need to show a different property. One thing that hasn't come up in my examples is what to do if you have a sentential letter. A sentential letter is a statement P through Z, and it represents something that's either just true or false. And the nice thing about sentential logic is that it's true or false uh, regardless of things like a universe of discourse or anything, because there's no quantification. 
In this case, you would actually just want to set your statement P or Q or whatever to be true or false in your model like so. Uh, this rarely sort of comes up now that we're in proper predicate logic, but just so you know, if you do see sentential letters, you just treat them sententially like we did with truth tables by stipulating a truth or falseness to it. A really common question is how do I know how many things to have in my universe of discourse when creating a finite abstract model? Now, there is a theorem here uh, that actually gives you sort of the upper bound that you would ever need to consider. And this theorem says, if an argument with n predicates is invalid, you can construct a model to demonstrate this invalidity with no more than two to the n things in the universe of discourse. Now, that sounds great, uh, but this theorem is useless, and I don't suggest you ever apply this theorem in practical uh, sort of application where you're generating models. What you should really do is let the translation guide you and be flexible when you want to add elements uh, as needed based off of the demands of the translation. When we move into multiplace semantics, right now we're still doing single place examples, we'll do many more examples where you actually have to add an element to your universe of discourse to make the model work. And we don't need a fancy theorem to tell us how many we should start with, because this theorem actually gives us the upper bound, and it will tell us way more information than is really needed. Even though abstract translation really does the job for us, we might want to know whether or not there's a mechanical way to build a counterexample, a more mechanical way that doesn't rely on sort of us thinking about uh, what does the abstract sort of language mean, and so on. It turns out there is. It's called truth functional expansion. Uh, and truth functional expansion is very powerful and useful in a lot of ways, but it's not particularly useful for creating a model because it has large limitations to it. So in our next lecture video, we will learn how to do truth functional expansions, and eventually we will learn to take that skill to build mechanically finite abstract models that can demonstrate semantic properties.